Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus, dear friends. The part of God's word that we'll give our attention to this afternoon comes from the prophet Zephaniah chapter 3. He writes, Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion, and do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. This is the word of our God. Chances are you haven't heard too many sermons from the prophet Zephaniah. In the schedule of Bible readings that we use in our worship services here at Bethany, a selection from Zephaniah comes up only once every three years. And I checked back three years ago when it came up, and we didn't preach on it then, so it's been at least six years since we've heard from the prophet Zephaniah here at Bethany. Well, tonight's the night. Zephaniah lived about 650 years before Jesus was born. He lived about 50 years before the Babylonians overran the southern kingdom of Judah and carried off so many of its people into captivity. It was a time of incredible turmoil for the people of God. And at least the first part of Zephaniah's prophecy would not have brought them very much comfort. Zephaniah doesn't mince any words about Judah's future. Even though God had sent one prophet after another to call his people to repentance, so many of them had refused to listen to that call. And so now Zephaniah comes to confront God's people with their sin. They continued to worship idols. Their wealth and their comfortable lifestyle made them very complacent when it came to their life of faith. They filled their bellies with food and drink, but they were failing to fill their hearts with God's word. They were very concerned about building fine houses for themselves, but they didn't have a lot of regard for taking care of God's temple. They honored and even revered the celebrities of their day, but they neglected the poor, the sick, and the widows among them. They had this attitude that God was kind of far off and distant, that God really wasn't going to do anything good or bad, no matter what. And that's not just all ancient history. I mean, the sins that troubled God's people back in Zephaniah's day are sins that continue to trouble God's people today. You wonder how many words, if any, Zephaniah would have to change if he were confronting us. Well, as a result of their sin, Zephaniah also announced God's judgment that was coming. And he announced it with some of the most severe language that you find anywhere in the Bible. In chapter 1 of his prophecy, God said, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth. Their wealth will be plundered, their houses demolished. The cry on the day of the Lord will be bitter, that day will be a day of wrath. God continues, he says, I will bring distress on the people and they will walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. Just a little taste of Zephaniah's prophecy. 
But it shows very clearly God's righteous anger over sin. It shows what we deserve on account of our sin. Zephaniah paints this picture of God's people being completely overwhelmed and overcome by their enemies. Satan is in the driver's seat. Sin is dominating people's hearts and lives. Death and judgment are waiting out there on the horizon. But you see, it's against that dark, dreary backdrop that God's amazing grace in sending Jesus stands out just all the more clearly. When the Lord comes near, he humbles his enemies. He humbles our enemies. About midway through chapter 3 of his book, the last chapter, Zephaniah's message changes completely. He says, the Lord has taken away your punishment. Evidence of the people's sin against God had been presented. Their guilt was painfully clear. God's judgment that was decreed was perfectly just. But then God's own son steps in to rescue and to save. He comes to take what we deserve. He carries our sin and shoulders our guilt and endures our punishment. The Lord has taken away your punishment. Zephaniah says he has turned back your enemy. The idea here is that the Savior has literally thrown out any and every enemy that God's people face. It's the same word that was used to describe clearing trash out of a house. It's a neat picture. We understand it. When that garbage truck comes and the bin is emptied into the back, we know that we're never going to see that junk again. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, our greatest enemies of sin, death, and the devil have been thrown out for good. And so Zephaniah tells us what the wonderful result of that is. The Lord, the King of Israel, is now with you. With sin out of the picture, thanks to Jesus, there's nothing now that stands in the way of God's presence with us. In Old Testament times, God was present among his people at the temple. But even then, that barrier of sin was still pretty clear to see. There was that curtain in the temple that kept people from entering into God's direct presence. Only the high priest, and only once a year, could enter into that most holy place. But at Christmas time, the Lord draws near. We welcome Emmanuel. The name means literally God with us. We marvel at Jesus' gracious, physical presence among his people here on earth. He came to do everything that Zephaniah promised so that there could never again be anything to separate us from our God. Before he ascended into heaven, Jesus promised, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. And so Zephaniah says, never again, Will you fear any harm? Because the Lord is with us. That's the reason for the joy that Zephaniah calls for from God's people. He says, Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. It's pretty obvious that that's no ho-hum word of thanks and praise that's being called for. It means that we should be absolutely thrilled. It's the difference, I suppose, between getting that nice pair of slippers that you knew was coming and getting that one thing that you always wanted but never dreamed that anyone would get for you. The Lord has come near and he's humbled our enemies. He's driven them out for good. And that fills us with joy. It fills us with a joy that leads us to want to make those changes that the prophets of God 
had been calling for for centuries. To love God above all things in our lives. To trust him completely in all that we do and to serve him with everything that we are and everything that we have. That's what that joy produces. But God knows, of course, that as we go about our lives in this world, fear often wins out over joy. And that fear can continue to cause problems in our relationship with God and in the service that we wish to offer him. And so God comes to his people with another word of encouragement. He says, do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The picture there is of somebody who is given up. Somebody who feels completely defeated in their life. They look at the circumstances around them and they don't see how they're going to be able to accomplish anything good whatsoever. And so they don't even really try. Have there been times when you can relate to those kinds of feelings? You face setbacks, struggles, even tragedies in your, in your life, and you fear that there's just no way that this could ever get better. You struggle against sin and temptation, and you find yourself on the losing end of that struggle day after day. And before long, you're resolved to keep on struggling and keep on battling. Well, that gets lost as well. You give up. You have this desire to serve God in your lives, but you fear that not much is going to really come from it. You've tried that before and nothing really happened. You've invited those people a number of times and they haven't come. So why bother? God says, do not fear. Do not let your hands hang limp. There are going to be plenty of things in our lives bad things, even tragic things. And yet as God's people, we need not fear any real or eternal harm because he's with us. We're still going to fall into sin. Satan is still stalking us. Physical death is still waiting for us. And yet those things have been rendered completely powerless because the one who has taken away our punishment, the one who has thrown out all of our enemies, He's still with us, so we can rejoice. God says, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. How could we ever give up when we know that the almighty God is at our side? Nothing is impossible with him. Paul expresses the confidence that every Christian has when he says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. To the Christians in Corinth, Paul writes, Stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Because of Jesus' work for us and in us, we can serve him with joy and confidence every day of our lives. We can take up that battle against sin and temptation every day with that spirit of victory in our hearts because we know Jesus has already conquered. We can face any trial in life and even death itself with the confidence that God is at our side. And so we have nothing to fear. We can set out to serve God in all that we do, despite the lack of progress and success that we might see at times, knowing that our labor in the Lord is never in vain. We go out and share the gospel in this world knowing that we are sharing the power of God for salvation and that that message is going to accomplish just exactly what he intended for it. Thanks be to Christ, God's people can and will produce the sort of fruit, serve God in the way that he desires. And that gives us reason to rejoice. We know, as I was talking with the kids, there are so many reasons that we have for joy in our hearts.
But you know what's amazing? Zephaniah points out that the joy doesn't stop with us. When as God's people, we are faithfully serving him because of everything that Jesus has done for us, Zephaniah tells us that God himself is overcome with joy as well. He says, he will take great delight in you. He looks at what we do as his people. He knows that formerly we were at the mercy of our enemies, but now we are his people, serving him faithfully, and he's delighted by it. He says, in his love, he will no longer rebuke you. That little phrase can also mean that God is silent in his love. The idea is that God is kind of silently observing his children as they go about their lives of serving him. And he's thrilled with what he sees. It's kind of the idea of the parent who sits back and quietly watches as their child freely does exactly what they've been taught and raised to do. And they're thrilled with it. But Zephaniah also points out that God's silence isn't going to last forever. He says, he will rejoice over you with singing. It's one of the very few verses in the Bible, I think, that talks about God singing to his people. Can you imagine what that must sound like? Can you imagine what that will sound like on the day that Jesus brings us to his side in heaven? You know, maybe think of your favorite Christmas hymn sung by somebody with an absolutely beautiful voice in a candlelit church on Christmas Eve. We love that. But then think of what it must sound like when God sings his very own love song and to know that he is singing it because of you. When the Lord comes near, he humbles his enemies so that he and his people can rejoice together. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.